It's really great to be here preaching. Welcome to everybody online as well. I tuned in last week online. It was so good to be a part of this community. Nita and I have connected in over the last four weeks or so, and it's so wonderful to be here and to see Pastor Marty again. I saw Marty <laughs> in Bible college as well. So Marty came as part of the, the Ashgrove team with Tim Sweetman, the, the Ashgrove, and then Bridgie, yes. And all I remember of Marty, we, so we weren't necessarily close at college, but I, I kind of feel like that's probably not my issue, but more Marty's issue. Uh, that's a joke, of course. Um, he was always up the front and very studious and very respectful. Is this ringing true? From what I know, that just sounds like Marty, doesn't it? He's just such a wonderful guy. And when we think about Marty in, in our uh, Queensland Baptist circles, finding a pastor who's on about the right things, the mission, the gospel, and also embodying that deep, caring love for the community around him. You're blessed to have Marty as your pastor. You're blessed to have him. Now, Anita and I have planted a church, and I can tell you as a fact that church planters age three years for every year. So the church has been going for about 16 years, Marty, so in kind of like dog years, that's 48 years on you. And so uh, because I had a bit of time this week, I uh, thought I'd show you the, the, the reality of what I mean by this. And so um, this is a picture of Marty now. I just found that on the website. That's just a picture of Marty, and he is a handsome guy. Come on. <laughs> But you could be on Gardening Australia front cover or something, I'm not even sure, but fantastic uh, picture. Now, if Marty was a pastor away from church planting where you age at a more rapid rate because of the stress and the pressure of starting a ministry, you might have had a pastor that looked something like this. <laughs> Look at those eyes. If you're online at the moment, you can just take a screenshot right now and feel free to send that around as much as you like. There's so much youthful optimism in those eyes and hope. And because the app cost me $5, I thought I'd start a uh, Saturday night trying to help Marty find a new identity, a new look, if he wanted to. So this app had other settings, so I'll show you a couple of them. This is if Marty was a lead singer or guitarist in a 90s rock band, which I think, I mean, just fantastic. This is Marty if he was a Disney character. I thought, I thought that looked really cool as well. Uh, this is Marty uh, if Marty decided to not be as disciplined and stop eating all the pies as he does now. This is what Marty would look like, um, more like me, uh, who doesn't have that same sense of discipline. And this is Marty in five years' time <laughs> at the current rate. So. so I'll be getting a refund on my app, uh, is what I'm hearing here. Uh, in all seriousness, mate, 16 years and planting a church is no small feat. It's an incredible achievement, and you are an incredible church. And I'm, as Nita and I have watched and observed over the last few weeks, we just can't help but feel that God's got something for the Grove. If you've been part of the journey right from the beginning, and we're in this brand new building, fantastic. But I'm, I'm convinced, I believe, that the best for the Grove isn't behind us, but before us. And I'm praying that in a brand new building that we're gonna see scores of young people putting dents in the walls and marks on the walls because all our young people are coming into this place. We're going to see baptisms from families and kids and young adults, young and old alike. I'm praying that that Joel 2.28 passage, that our old people will see, dream, our young people will have visions, will be a reality in this place. That the gospel will continue to be preached in this area. Did you know that there are 5.3 million people who live in Queensland? And it's going to take a combined effort of all of our Baptist churches to see people come to know Jesus. All of us going together. Queensland Baptist has this wonderful vision of seeing 5,000 people come to faith. 30 churches planted 
in the next few years. What? How good is that? And the grove is very much amongst it. And so my prayer is to see this church continue to thrive, continue to grow, continue to build in Jesus' name. More and more people come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Saviour, where the gospel is proclaimed and demonstrated in, in word and in deed. That's my prayer for this place. And, and I'm going to preach on this today. The holistic realisation of the gospel in both word and deed. What does that look like? To have the gospel both proclaimed and demonstrated. Uh, just before I get to that, I wanted to share a little bit about my role. I've, I've recently started as the director of mission in Carinity. Now, Don McPherson is a, a very much a part of our church, and so I took on the role from Don, and he has done an excellent job getting it all ready. Uh, my role as the director of mission is to build on the wonderful chaplaincy efforts that Don has put in place, but also it affords me the opportunity to speak across our organisation to help Carinity align with our Queensland Baptist vision and to see our strategic intent become Jesus-focused in our care. And I get to speak at different churches around the place and, and, and find ways to partner with churches in the gospel to see how we can see 5.3 million Queenslanders come to know Jesus. Carinity has a whole heap of different ways of caring for the disadvantaged and the marginalised in our communities. We have 12 aged care homes uh, that we look into, we, uh, that we manage. We have home care, independent living units. We've got youth hostels like Arana. If you've heard of Arana in, in uh, Bald Hills, a wonderful crisis youth hostel. We've got counselling centres and community centres, and we also have a, a special assistance schools. And I want to show you a quick clip that goes for 20 seconds. And this clip is of a school called Shalom in Townsville. Shalom is one of our indigenous schools. 70% of the kids that go are indigenous, and the rest are made up of predominantly Torres Strait Islanders and also um, uh, whiteys going and, and being a part of that community. Wonderful chaplain up there, a guy named Andrew Bollum, and he's so passionate about the gospel that he's gone and he's even planted a church straight out of this school. It goes for about 20 seconds. I want to just play you this clip. The heart of Shalom is the Shalom way. And part of the Shalom way is that we embrace every student from wherever they've come from and whoever they are. There's a peace that fills our school and, and it comes from heaven. Uh, it is the presence of God. Everyone comments on it. They notice it. Uh, they feel it. And uh, it's embraced. So Shalom is a school that is determined to practice the gospel and live the gospel in word and in deed. And that's something that I think is a, a fantastic model for all of us in our churches. When we see the gospel proclaimed holistically, lived by Jesus, we see this dual approach of word and deed, hand in hand. In fact, when Jesus started his ministry, when he commences his ministry, remember after his baptism, he gets taken into the desert for 40 days and for 40 nights, is tempted by Satan, resists Satan, and comes back filled with the Spirit into Nazareth, into Galilee. And he goes into a synagogue and he's handed a scroll and he unfurls the scroll and he finds Luke chapter 4 from Isaiah. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, it reads from Isaiah. And this is what it says. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Right there in the first ministry engagement of Jesus, he displays word and deed, that he has come as the embodiment of heaven on earth to proclaim good news to the poor, the good news that he is come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to proclaim liberty to the captives, that if you're oppressed and downtrodden and disadvantaged, that you have hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Wow. But not only that, he also is ministering practically. He has come to recover sight for the blind, not just the, the physically blind, but the spiritually blind. And he has come to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
Jesus in his first sermon says that his gospel ministry is about word and deed, proclamation and demonstration. And our example is Jesus. Our approach needs to be like this. The, the fact is though, I've been in ministry for 20 years and I can tell you that we tend to default towards one or the other. We tend to default towards either a, a more instructional proclamation type, listen to me while I tell you about Jesus, or a more of a demonstration being the hands and feet of Jesus and caring. I was walk, uh, driving down um, a road in Sunnybank just this last week, a very, very busy road, and there was a lady walking her dog, and that, that wasn't the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing, which is why my, my eyes drifted, was because she was carrying wearing an A-frame, and on this A-frame, in big, bold letters, was repent, Jesus is returning soon, or something like that, repent, Christ is returning soon. And all, everybody on that road could not help but notice this lady with that A-frame. And as people were lining up at the lights, the 50-odd set of cars, we were noticing this lady, and I was thinking about this going, I wonder if people feel that the proclamation aspect of the gospel is to, to copy this type of approach, where, where we preach the message through bullhorn or big bolded signs, the message of the gospel, which says that, that we're sinners, that God is a holy, perfect God, and he will punish the wicked. Repent, because that time is coming. This approach, and just operating in this way, almost excludes the responsibility and the privilege of caring for the poor and those around us. It, it's more costly in our relationship to befriend people to share the gospel. Now, that's a approach, and, and actually, that's one part of the gospel, because we know that God doesn't need us to share the gospel. The Word of God is alive and active, it is powerful, stronger than any two-edged sword. The word of God will do the work without us. And so that part of the gospel is certainly true, but it misses Jesus, the, the wonderful Jesus, the self-sacrificial act of the cross and the way he led. There's one way of proclamation that says, if I just preach it, then God will do his work without my personal engagement. And of course, on the other extreme is the people who feel that their call to share the gospel is just simply be really nice people. There's this quote, you've probably heard it. It says, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You've heard that quote before? That is such a reductionistic quote of the gospel message. It contains a part of the gospel but it reduces the gospel to this little approach and it takes Matthew 25's example. So remember when Jesus teaches and says that if you go and visit someone in prison or in hospital or if you give house somebody or clothe someone or feed someone and give someone a glass of water who is thirsty in my name, you're doing it for me personally, you remember that story? People take that as permission to just think that is the gospel mission. If we just care for people and feed people and help people, then that's the gospel message. And it, and it avoids any discomfort for me sharing about who Jesus is and what he's done. And friends, of course, I'm, I'm talking extremes, aren't I, here? I'm talking either, and, and we've got to be careful that we don't actually create a, an evangelistic, schizophrenic approach where we pendulum swing from one extreme to the other, because that's not ideal. Our approach needs to be a balanced gospel ministry that contains both proclamation and demonstration. You're with me? That contains both word and deed. And so what I want to do today is just look at the life of Jesus, our perfect example. Let's see how the master does it. How does he go about doing this? And then at the end, we're going to look at what's our response? What can we do to, to model this personally uh, here at the Grove? And so the first thing that Jesus does, uh, first of all, let me just set the scene. We don't have time to go into 33 years of Jesus' life, okay? We don't even have time to go into three years of ministry with the remaining 45 minutes that I have left. 
That was a joke. Um, the remaining few minutes that I have left. But there is, actually, in Mark chapter 4 and 5, there is a 24-hour period of ministry that I'm going to invite you to come and be a part of. So if you've got your phone or if you've got your Bible, open it, biblegateway.com. You should get reception here. The Wi-Fi, I don't know what it is, but you should be able to get it. Mark chapter 4 and Mark 5. If you've got your Bibles, open it up because we're going to do kind of like a, a, a look through 24 hours of ministry and see how Jesus goes about it. And I want you to think like this. In there's reality TV shows, there's a camera placed. Just imagine the camera is placed on on one of the disciples and they're watching Jesus. We're gonna watch Jesus and we're gonna see how he fulfills that Luke 4 prophecy in himself of practicing the gospel message in word and deed. So Mark chapter four, we're gonna fly through this, skipping stones, it's very deep but we don't have time to go into all of it. So Mark chapter four, verse one, starts off through to verse 33 with Jesus' proclamation ministry, his teaching. And there are so many fantastic parts of Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 33, that I wish we could go into, but we simply don't have the time today. But we just need to know that Jesus' proclamation ministry was powerful, was persuasive, was creative. And elsewhere, we can say that Jesus' ministry, his proclamation ministry, was uncompromising. He didn't hide from the fact that he was here to save those who were lost. In Mark chapter four and five, we see Jesus use parables, and parables are the way that Jesus taught. Parables are these rich nuggets of kingdom teaching that the more you look into, the more it reveals something about the kingdom of God. And so Jesus uses parables. Verse 33, Jesus spoke many parables like these to the people who followed him. These were the only way he taught them, Although when he was alone with his chosen few, he interpreted all the stories so the disciples truly understood. The three now very famous parables that he talked about was the parable of the good soil, the seed in the good soil, where we know that Jesus says that the soil is scattered around, but the soil that falls on good soil reaps a, a crop some 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. And the key for that is verse 20. Look at verse 20 in Mark 4. Those who hear the word and accept it. In order to understand the proclamation ministry of Jesus, we need to hear the word and accept it. It's a faith response. We need to believe. And this theme of faith comes throughout the teaching of Jesus. The next parable that he goes through is the teaching of the city on a hill. Those who have received Jesus by faith and become filled with the light and the life and the love of God it's, you, be, you become transformed. You become like a beacon to those around you. Now, what city who sits on a hill would cover themselves up? No, you're called as the city of God, the beautiful people of God, transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun. You are transformed to be a transforming agent in the world. So don't hide your faith. Let it shine. Let it shine in this world today. That's the next parable that he talks about. The other parable that he talks about is the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed, the tiny little seed that when planted in the garden becomes the largest of the garden plants and becomes a, a, a life-giving tree for your garden. And what Jesus is saying, if you have faith as small as a little seed and you receive Jesus by faith, then that seed takes root inside of you and over the course of your life will bloom into the person of God that he intends you to be. It starts with faith. And so Jesus' proclamation ministry, his teaching in Mark chapter four, verses one to 33, went for all day. And so the first part of his ministry here in this 24-hour whirlwind journey with Jesus was his teaching ministry using parables with the theme of faith. You with me? That stunned silence is very reassuring, so I'm just gonna keep going thinking that you said yes. So Jesus isn't like some Middle Eastern guru sitting under a tree, sprouting divine wisdom. Jesus is the embodiment of divine wisdom in practice. And so he doesn't just teach, 
Jesus goes and does. So have a look at what happens next. He demonstrates the kingdom of God. And he does this by, by revealing authority, his authority, his divine authority to overcome the world. If you have a look in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, that day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. A whole day of teaching ministry. That's a long day of ministry. And at the end of it, Jesus was already in a boat. The other disciples got in and they traveled over to the other side of the lake. And as they were going, a vicious storm rises. And you know the story. A vicious storm rises up. And the disciples start freaking out. They're going to drown. And remember, these aren't greenhorn sailors. These are veterans. They knew this lake like the back of their hand. And when they're starting to get scared, there's something to be scared about. And they wake Jesus up and see Jesus' response in verse 39. Terrified, they woke Jesus up. And Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? As a parent, when I get woken up, I tend to respond angrily, but Jesus isn't doing that here. He's not angry at the fact that he just woke up after a long day of ministry, keeping in mind that for the last hours and hours of the day before, he was preaching and proclaiming and teaching about the kingdom of God and the importance of faith. And here are the disciples in a boat with the king of kings, with the ability to do what Jesus did and calm the storm, but they didn't believe. Jesus was challenging their lack of faith. He gets up and he demonstrates his authority over nature. If we keep going, uh, the next thing that he does, the next part is in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, the boat hits the shore and Jesus and the disciples get out of the boat. This is part of the 24 hours following Jesus. And as soon as he gets out, a demoniac man runs at Jesus. And Some of the other gospel writers who share this account state there might have been one or two men. But these people were so enslaved by the enemy that they cut themselves and ran screaming among the tombs and couldn't be contained, couldn't be chained. And yet the the presence of Jesus comes as enough to prompt a response and there's this dramatic encounter where Jesus shows us again that he's not just saying that he's come to set the oppressed free, he demonstrates it. And he does just this. In in Luke chapter 5, you can see that there's this encounter involving pigs, casting demons out, and the man sitting in his right mind, completely healed and restored. The people come and beg Jesus to leave, so he does, and in verse 18, the man was about to jump in with Jesus. In Mark chapter 5, verse 18, he writes, Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus didn't let him and said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Isn't that interesting? Jesus sent this person out to be his witness right up. You know, God has done some great things in your life. Jesus has commissioned you as well to go and tell how the Lord has set you free as well. Hallelujah. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. In 24 hours, we've seen Jesus profound, proclaiming ministry, creatively using parables about faith. We see Jesus demonstrate his authority over nature. We see demons flee in Jesus' name. That Jesus has full authority over evil. If we keep going, the next part of the story in the 24 hours following Jesus, in Mark chapter 5, 21 to 34, Jesus has full authority over sickness as well. Does anyone else need to hear that today? Jesus has full authority over sickness. Amen? There was a lady who had spent all her money trying to find healing and cure for the hemorrhaging she was experiencing for the last 12 years. She had no money left, desperate, sees Jesus coming past and reaches out and touches his cloak. You know, we just, in faith, need to hold on to Jesus, desperate for Jesus. 
And you know the story, Jesus turns around, felt power go out of him and said, who touched me? Gets to the bottom of the story and she explains that she was healed and Jesus says to her in verse 34, he said, turned to her and he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus has full authority over nature, over evil, over sickness and there are people today who need to claim that. We're healed in Jesus' name. And the last part of the the 24-hour period is it shows that Jesus has full authority over death. In Mark 5, 35 to 43, the last of the whirlwind 24 hours following Jesus, that little hold-up with healing this lady was obviously enough of a delay to prevent him from getting to Jairus' house where he was going initially and he hears word that Jairus' daughter had passed away. Jesus' response, verse 36. What does Jesus say? He says, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus arrives to Jairus' house, takes in some of the disciples, and raises her from the dead. Wow. Wow. Jesus has full authority over death and we know that this is just a little snapshot of what he does on the cross. On the cross, he takes away our sickness and he defeats evil and he takes away disease and he has full authority over nature and he has full authority over death and he took your sin and my sin and all their sin for all people, for all time, and he rose from the dead. That's our Jesus. He shows us very clearly what gospel holistic ministry looks like. It contains both word and deed. Okay, you catching your breath? You're with me still? We're all right? We're looking at Jesus' ministry here, 24 hours, fulfilling the Luke chapter 4, the proclamation of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach and proclaim the good news, to demonstrate the year of the Lord's favor. We've seen Jesus' approach. Now, what does this mean for us here at the Grove? That's the sticky point, the challenge here for us. I would think that you, your challenges might be different to mine. I've, I've been joining in with Anita for, for the last three or four weeks. Like, you know the story of this church more than, more than I do. So if you have a look at this passage of Scripture, Mark 4 and Mark 5, we can get three really quick little applications that I think might apply to us. Let me run through these. These are are dot points. The first thing that we read from this story is that none of the disciples were engaged in the ministry. Did you notice? In Mark chapter 4 and 5, it was Jesus who calmed the storm. It was Jesus who, who taught. It was Jesus who healed, who healed the sick person. It was Jesus who rose the person from the dead. It was Jesus who cast out the demons. But it was the disciples who were just watching, just watching Jesus do the work. And friends, there's, that tells us that there's a master and apprentice approach that Jesus is wanting us to be a part of. Our job is to watch what the master does and follow his lead. Now, what does an apprentice do? If you're an apprentice, what's your first, usually six months in the job? Washing, sweeping, fetching things, watching the master do the work, asking questions and learning and growing. It's very important. That means for us in the Grove, where we're serving, we're being prepared for ministry. Where we're serving, we're being apprenticed to Jesus. We're watching the master in preparation for the ministry. It's really important that we see ourselves as fellow servants and practicing humility in preparation for what the Lord has got for us. What we see Jesus here in the next chapter, in Mark chapter 6, is he sends out the disciples, two by two, remember? Sends them out. He says, go and have a crack at it now and come back and show me and tell me what you've done. There's an aspect of ministry that says that we are to be prepared for what is to come. That preparation is right now. How are you preparing? We're looking at the master at work. We're serving in church. We're serving God, and we're ready to go. That's the first thing that's the most obvious thing out of this whole thing for me, master and apprentice. The second thing is that faith 
is essential in gospel ministry, in both proclamation and demonstration. And this is twofold the challenge for us here. Faith is essential, and if you are serving in proclamation ministry or demonstration ministry, and you're doing that without needing to exhaust faith, you're doing it wrong. If you're involved in ministry and it doesn't require your faith to grow, you're doing it wrong. We cannot expect to see the kingdom of God come in our own strength and understanding. We need to be ready to grow. We have to be willing to be stretched. If you've been in church for a long, long time and you haven't needed to exert faith, then it's time to grow. It's time to come back and become an apprentice. This might mean that you need to go on a mission field. It might mean that if you're just serving by doing good works, don't stop doing that. But if you're just serving by doing good works, maybe your faith needs to stretch to be ready to proclaim about Jesus in that space. Do not rely on your own strength to see the kingdom of God come because it just can't. You can only receive it by faith. You with me? That's the first challenge for us. The second challenge is that if you're feeling like you are struggling in your faith, Understand that it's just the size of a mustard seed. That's all we need to do. And what we tend to do is when we're struggling is retreat, don't we? We retreat. But friends, in this place, there are wonderful people who are faithfully serving Jesus. Get alongside uh, Marty and Leanne and, and Andrew McCafferty, Don McPherson. Come amongst them. Come and be a part and say, why do you believe? Help me in my unbelief. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Become part of the family. Don't exclude yourself, actually come in more and understand and seek to learn and grow yourselves. So the second part is faith is crucial. We're growing in our faith, but we need to use faith and have faith to do the ministry of the kingdom. Don't rely on your own strength to try and see the kingdom of God come because it can't happen in your strength. The last thing coming out of this is that we have to expect rejection and expect conflict. Sandwiched in that 24 hours of Jesus, Mark chapter 3 and in Mark chapter 6 is rejection and conflict. At the end of Mark chapter 3, if you've read that story, Jesus' parent, um, mother and his family came to fetch Jesus, thinking he was out of his mind as he was teaching. That's his own family. That's got a sting. That sense of people not knowing the things of the kingdom. And then if you fast forward at the end of this 24-hour period, Jesus returns back to Nazareth where he's rejected as a prophet with no honour in his hometown. His own family reject him. You can expect that as you go about holistic gospel ministry in word and deed, that you will face opposition from people you don't even expect. My niece works at a coffee shop and that's up near my work and I get to go and pick up coffees on the way every now and then. And unfortunately, she's uh, moved towards more of a woke type of of lifestyle and, and really struggles with her Christian roots. And when I go and pick up a coffee, she doesn't even look at me. She's right there. She doesn't even talk to me. It's got nothing to do with me but the things that I believe. What happens when you experience that rejection and you experience that opposition? I believe that Jesus is calling us to not be mouse like mice and run away when the big noise comes and the resistance comes, but to stand firm like elephants, strong in the faith and feel the resistance of the wind. It's just like a wind flapping an ear. It's not very big. We're just going to keep pushing through in Jesus' name. We do not let conflict and we do not let resistance stop us from kingdom work. Amen? And so just a few little challenges for us and I know I've gone over time and I apologise for that. My last thing I want to do is just invite us to to pray together and if this is where your heart is, if you're feeling challenged, thanks Henry and the team, if you can come up, that'd be great. But if if we can really be challenged and sit in this, 
Imagine what the next week will look like. <laughs> Imagine what your next 24 hours are going to look like if you went, I'm on about this holistic gospel mission of word and deed. There are 5.3 million Queenslanders. And this church has opened up a new building in the last few months and it's fantastic. I love it. You know, there's a, there's a and I know you're aware of this, there's experiences of churches who have opened a new facility that experience a lull in energy. You've probably heard this as well because of the, the weight of having to get something like this pulled together and finally be in. But friends, the reason why the church is here is not because there's a building. The reason why the church is here is because you, for 16 years, have been living the gospel message in word and in deed. So don't rely on this building because you will not fit 5.3 million Queenslanders in here. What it requires is to keep doing what the Grove has been doing, to model and build your life on the Word of God, to proclaim boldly and courageously the message of the gospel and to live it, to demonstrate it via good deeds and being the hands and feet of Jesus and praying for healing for those who need healing and, 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 and helping people who feel estranged from God to come into the fold and into the family. That's how I became a believer. I became a Christian at age 15. I was homeless. I was living on the street in Meribah, three hours north of here. I was putting myself through year 11, and I came from a very rough background. And an awful situation. I'm not going to go into it, but one night I was lying on my bed on the couch that I was living on at the time, and I prayed the most honest four words I'd ever prayed in my life the most honest four words, God, please help me. That's, that, I didn't go to church. I didn't have a Christian upbringing. God, please help me. And he did. Some guys from my school who I didn't really know, they were always sitting up the front too and I was always up the back, but they came, Michael and Adam, and started talking to me about Jesus. They began proclaiming the message of Jesus. At school, they began discipling me. They invited me into their community, little Church of Christ Church in Maribor, 60 people, hardly any young people, mostly oldies. And for the first time in my life, I saw the demonstration of the gospel message. I saw people who genuinely loved each other. I saw people who found acceptance and belonging. I found healing. I found love and acceptance. You know, when Jesus says that when we're gathered together in his name, we love each other, the whole world will take notice. It's true. I can tell you from experience, it is true. And so let's be a church that doesn't just rely on a building to see the kingdom of God. It takes faith-filled, courageous people willing to proclaim and demonstrate the goodness of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, we just want to pause in this place right now and we say, dear Lord, that we love you but we can do nothing without you. And God, you have transformed us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son you love because of grace, because of Jesus. And we cannot thank you enough. Oh, Lord, would you restore the joy of our salvation? Oh, Lord, would you keep us burdened at night? with our loved ones who don't know you yet, with our community who don't know you yet, with our neighbours who don't know you yet, Jesus. Oh, Lord, would you give us that sense like Paul had, that he would give up his salvation for just one Jewish brother to come to faith. Lord, let us be desperate, desperate enough to place all of our faith in you, Lord, the God who saves. And God, we would pray for courage to do this in the face of hostility and opposition in the world today, let us reflect Jesus this week. Let stories emerge this week. Let testimonies emerge this week of word and deed going together. Amen, amen, amen.